Marissa Khalid. But the reason we're, why you guys are here is to learn from one of the more experienced Missouri River paddlers that I'm friends with. Um, Linda Kaufman has been, I, I should have your little bio here, but I don't, so I'm just going to make stuff up, but, <laughs> <laughs> and she'll tell you, <laughs> she'll tell you the truth, but, um, um, but, you know, Linda is, is a lifetime educator, um, outdoor educator, um, and hopefully you will tell us a little bit about that, but whatever, um, you know, I met her through the MR340, she's been participating in that for many, many, many years in all kinds of configurations of boats and with different people. Um, and also just loves to get out paddling and explore all the different interesting tributaries and pieces of the river in this area. So she's here to just share, just to demythify that whole thing. For those of you guys that have not had a chance to paddle on the Missouri River, or maybe, you know, you know a little bit, you know your neighborhood and you're just kind of like, what else? What would make you more comfortable? Like she's just got the beat, so that's why she's here. Thank you so much um, for putting all this effort and knowledge. Oh. Am I on? Thank you, Steve, and thank you all for coming. Pretty exciting to talk to something that I hear in my heart. Had on the Missouri River, which uh, I did for since 1999. Yeah. So how many in the room have no experience on the Missouri River? One and two, okay. So I'm talking to you. And how many people have actually had the Missouri River? Most of you. So hopefully there's something for everyone in this talk. And here we go. So this is a little bit about when I began paddling. Um, this is a... Uh, Friend of mine, um, Holly, Kevin Marquette, who's actually here. She needed a kayak partner for um, adventure racing. And so she asked me if I would get a kayak and join her on the river, and we would train together, and she would do her adventure racing, and I would learn all about the Missouri River, and that's how it started. So I purchased at age 49 a perception yellow plastic kayak, and we had the river probably three times a week starting and at Providence Landing, which is on Perchy Creek, kind of upstream to Lupus and back again for a really long time. <laughs> Talk about that. So that, um, kind of coincidentally, when I first started paddling the river, uh, when I turned 50 years old, Cammie and I thought, well, maybe we should go pick up trash on the river, 50 pieces of trash, which was primarily plastic bottle and a little bit of styrofoam. So that was the same year that the big river cleanup also started. So it was kind of that cosmic universal connection, my little kayak cleanup on Missouri River's large cleanup. <laughs> this, these are just little tidbits about myself before we get, actually get into the big deal set. The other part of this full circle thing was I had had the river exclusively in a kayak or some sort of paddle configuration boat for about 20 years and had never been in a motorized boat until my first river cleanup with Kevin as my mostly as my first boat operator, which was a fun thing. So it was a whole new experience for me. So I'm beginning. As a paddler, and then coming full circle, you know, with a cleanup kind of a thing to a motorized different experience was part of my mantra here. So, um, and Kim and I decided after 10 years of paddling that maybe we should get go beyond with this. <laughs> and so we decided maybe this year we will do the Missouri River 340. So she and I were a mixed tandem that first year in 2009 and paddled the Missouri River 340. And that year we actually won the women's tandem, which is pretty fun. So get excited about that. So I paddled in some boat in some way since then. So 13 Missouri River 340s and Cammy 
also patterned it uh, in various ways, but primarily she's been my grandmother. So she's been the inspiration in the beginning and continues to be involved in the pattern. As you can see, there's different ways to do the Missouri River 340. You can do it solo, you can do it tandem, you can do it in Granico, you can do a big tandem, you can do it in team, you can do it on a crazy stand up paddleboard that's built by someone. <laughs> 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 All had their own, you know, special magical moments. So this is what the talk is about tonight, paddling the Missouri River. So the things I'd like to cover, just a snit on the Missouri River and what it is. And talking about the navigation aids, I think that for someone who's not paddled the river before, navigation aids are important. We'll get that talk about and understand and get that out. Right? And then we'll talk about the boats on the water. And your boat, your gear, some of the river hazards, river conditions, a little bit on safety, managing your boat, and then the most exciting part, which is at the end, creating your voyage of discovery, which is the magical moments that things you'll see every time you go out there. It's a different experience. So hopefully this will inspire those of you who have not done it. And those of you who have not done it a lot to continue and learn more about the backyard river. So this is just a little shot on the Missouri River, which is about 2,341 miles long. And in Missouri, it's 552 miles. And it actually has this nice geographical feature of touching four states of the corner of Missouri. It also borders Iowa, Nebraska, and uh, Kansas. So the Missouri River has four states in its boundaries, and a total of seven, I think, I'm all the way down from New York, Montana. There's any fact check that needs to be made. <laughs> so this, uh, we're going to cover navigation aids, and hopefully this is not too confusing for someone who's never been on the river. So when you paddle the river, you will see these symbols on the bank. You will see, let me see if I get my pointer before. So there'll be these kind of markers. These will be solid color. There will be these kind of markers, which will be diamond shaped. And these are in pairs and on posts. So if you're on the river and the left bank going down the river, down the stream will be on your left, the red symbol will be on your left, and the green symbol will be on your right. And these tell you two things. We give you instruction. Either you're going to stay on that bank or you're going to cross. So these symbols that are on the posts along the bank on either side of the river, the left or the or right side descending, we'll give you an instruction and we'll go over that the diagram. These are on the bank. These navigation aids are in the water. And the, the red movies, they call them nuns. And I think the nun name comes from the, they're actually pointed in the river. It's like a nun's hat. That's what I heard. It's correct. It actually and then the cans are shaped like pants, so they have green cans. So if you're traveling down the river, you would want to keep the red nuns on your right, on your left hand side, the green cans on your right hand side as you go to Alexander Street. There are also mild marker boards, and they should be on the channel side. This these navigation aids are important because it will let you know where the channel is. And the channel is where the barges will be. And I think for a, a first time cabinet, that's been the biggest worry. That's what I hear whenever they talk to me about, so oh, I can't believe you're paddling in the dirty, muddy water with all those barges. So it is a, a good concern, but it's not, if you know what to do, you know how to read the markers, and you know how to read the channel, you can stay out of the barges way. But the barges do have the right of way on the river. That's one thing about the channel. The other thing is, if you want to go fast, the channel is where the fastest water is. 
So knowing where the channel is is important for at least those three reasons and probably more. These are called day beacons. Sometimes they're called day markers. So it can be a little confusing, but once you get on the river and you see them, they'll start making sense. So I have a slide here that can be a little demonstration. So your boat, when you're traveling down the river, you come down on the left bank from a marker that is looking like a solid colored red triangle up at that end, you're coming down to that on the other side. And sometimes you'll have to kind of lean over your shoulder to see. I don't know if I'm going in and out of my microphone. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, to see the other side to get your next instruction because they are placed so that the barges can see them. And sometimes they're obscure because there's vines and trees growing around them. You can't really see them, but a lot of times you can. So kind of look for them. So, so you find, uh, you come down the river and you see that you finish your portion of your paddle on this left hand side. You look over your shoulder and you see this day marker, which is a diamond. The diamonds are always crossed across the river. So you'll Look for the diamond on the other side of the river, travel down here, and there you'll complete the crossing of the river. So then on the other side of the post where the markers are placed, you'll see your next instruction, which on this slide is staying on the right thing until, and this is the channel, because you can see kind of where the wing dikes are and there's red pink glow in the river to make the channel be for the barges they try to maintain a nine foot deep channel so that's the army corps of engineers task so there's the only drop structure which you'll see in the but right here in front of us tonight that helps direct the direction of the river so for you as a paddler you come here here's two more than a pair of markers this is telling you to cross the river again you look for the crossing marker on the other side, go to that marker, the day marker that is, and you completed your cross, you travel down the channel, and now you're going to stay on the left bank descending until you see another pair of day markers. This is the most confusing part of the talk. <laughs> So if you got this down, <laughs> should I add? Are there any questions? I don't know. <laughs> so there are other things that you can use. Um, if you can't see these markers, we have made, Kim and I made this a long ago. This is from the navigation charts of the uh, USGS. It tells you where the wing dikes are, it tells you where the channel markers are, the day beacons are. Um, and so we use this. There's also an app for your cell phone called Pro Paddler. I'm sure there's more than that one that also, if you get a cat cell service and it's working, you <laughs> can uh, see where you are in the river and where the ducks are in the river and where the channel is. So those are other things that, that uh, are available. This, uh, and I don't know how common this is anymore, this came. This was published in about what, 2004 when uh, the Lewis Clark by Centennial uh, was popular. And so the, this also has a lot of great information, including how to read the navigation aids or the day markers. So, probably none of that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just going to say that, like, I was talking to someone at the Corps of Engineers. One of their outreach guys, uh, I was talking to someone at the Corps of Engineers, one of their outreach guys the other day, and they're considering redoing these. Good. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. And they were basically asking me, like, what should we put in it? So I would like to talk to all of you other people about, like, what kind of stuff could be in another reprint of this book that would be interesting, both for, like, recreational boaters, but maybe, like, Interesting river stuff. Yes, and there, there's interesting river stuff in here, but there could be more. 
Because there's a lot of interesting rivers. Yeah, there. and a lot of it's Lewis and Clark, and so this one wouldn't be Lewis and Clark. Clark. It would be another totally different approach. Oh, that would be great. I'm excited about that. Okay, I just showed you that. Okay, so now we just talk about actually being on the river. So there are a lot of boats on the river sometimes, but not a lot. You, not usually, I mean. There are tons of barges, but um, the Missouri River does not have a lot of barge traffic. So um, not every time you go out on the river, you will see a barge. There are power boats um, that are there, some, but again, uh, there's it's not as suggested as it appears here. So <laughs> then if you look out on the river, <laughs> it's right. There's nothing, uh, you know, we haven't seen a bar, we haven't seen a pattern, we haven't seen a power one. So a lot of times it's a serene wilderness. And so um, we're talking, we're going to talk about using pattern being out there and not worrying about these. So what do you need to know if you're going to paddle the river? Let's talk about your boat. And I just learned the name, the three forty name of uh, this is actually stand up to new guy. Buddy man, our buddy man. <laughs> um, so I think that one of the most important things you can do is choose a new boat if you're a first time paddler on the Missouri River. It's very important to have both it's stable, a boat that is maneuverable. And a little bit of space for yourself if you're here. So stability. <laughs> this one, a 22 foot uh, hooky that had a gold wing on the back, which would not be a good choice for a first time ever. <laughs> it's a great boat, but and it's an end on uh, in you. So choose a stable boat. This is a maneuverable boat, which is um, another consideration. You will have to make sure that you have a boat that you can control and it can track well, so that you can go where you would like to go, but also in and out of the channel as needed or deal with the river features. So maneuverability is very important and a boat that you choose. And <laughs> make sure they're safe for yourself in your gear, which I know it's there. An iron skillet and a Dutch oven. With the end of the All kinds of things came out of the stuff. <laughs> But this actually a boat for me. I think that this boat is uh, a great boat, a great choice for someone who's a first time traveler on the Missouri River. It is very maneuverable, it's uh, compact, you know, it will carry you where you need to go, and it's very stable. Is that right? It is. Okay, so it's confirmed. This is a good choice. So once you've selected a boat that is manageable and controllable, and all those things, then you can figure out here. <laughs> there, you know, there's a lot of personal choice and what kind of gear you would like to bring. I don't usually bring that much gear, but um, some of the things that are important. So, protection from the sun and the wind. A hat that's secure, and I, on this hat, have a uh, clip on the back so the wind doesn't blow it off and we have to chase it down. Hard to lose it. Sunglasses and you know if you have the lanterns that you can put the sunglasses on. I have lost sunglasses in the river. Uh, rain gear, you know, uh, you can check the forecast that sometimes things happen on the river that are unpredictable. It's it's not a bad idea to have rain gear. A whistle. And I use a whistle um, not necessarily to signal um, um, another boat or I don't know if you can hear that, but, but another paddler. So uh, if you're stopping and someone's paddling with you and someone goes this way on the, sun, the sandbar and someone else goes another way over here, I have had uh, 
an incident where we couldn't find each other. So we just started whistling and we were able to find each other. Was whistle. So there's other things other than, I mean, there's a lot of applications to have to whistle. Well, first aid kit, and that doesn't need to be much. I usually have something for blisters. Um, a baler, you may take on water from just uh, water splash rain or a boat that runs close by. A baler is always a good thing to have. It's, and it's uh, spare clothing, uh, which is also for me a good thing to have. This boat. Um, it's Hunter. We turned this boat over at Brian Jeff City and we were approaching the boat right now. It wasn't cold that day, but it, if it was, I, I had dry clothes that I could change into. So you just kind of never know uh, things happen. But this is a tippy boat. So if you have a stable boat, it's not have to you. <laughs> And then appropriate footwear. That's a, that's, I've seen a lot of variation in that. I prefer um, Tevas or Keens that the water can, they're breathable so that you don't have something like feet the whole time. But again, that's a personal choice. If you want to paddle at night, and this, after being familiar with the river, some, you might like to go out at night a little bit. There are, uh, the nighttime basics, the gear that you would want to take, and this would include the navigation lights, which are required. And most paddlers have these navigation lights that are starboard and port side, and they just turn so that people can see you and they can tell what direction your boat is. And then the Stern line, which is like that these are readily available. It's not the only kind of light out there, but if you are having a night, these are required. Linda, so, how do you attach those to your boat? So these are Velcro with a clip. There's a little clip here. So a lot of times there's the, uh, I forget what that's called, but you clip it on that's uh, some kind of a line that's on your boat. And then I have a piece of Velcro that I have attached the opposite piece of Velcro to, uh, you can almost see them there, to the boat itself so that they are secured that way. And then I move this around something like the handle so that we don't lose these because these can't fall off. So we have, and you can do this with other gear too. Tie it to the boat if you're afraid you might drop it in the water or you might tip over, which is not likely, but if your gear is secure, you won't lose it. I did learn the hard way. <laughs> and we lost gear. Don't we all? <laughs> it's hard to, it just went floating. It is hard to get the gear if you lost it in the river. Another uh, important thing um, to have a headlamp, and we do, there are headlamps that have the red uh, nightlight on it so that you're not blinding yourself when you try to see what's in the boat or what you need a headlamp for. But a white headlamp is fine too. I would put reflector tape on the paddle and on the boat also. So that they, uh, they can see you, and if you drop your paddle in the water, you can hang your headlight headlamp on the paddle itself and find it at night, which is also happening. <laughs> um, I have one thing to add too, and that is that I've heard from barge captains that you know the strips of red and white reflective tape that you might stick on the back of a truck or something like that. If you put those on the side of your boat, their radar can actually pick that up. Oh, excellent. Yep. Because we do mention radar in the barge slide, so that would be good. Yeah. This is something you can put on your life jacket in the event that you went over. So this is the magic part of the show. Oh. <laughs> when it gets wet and it will 
Three, or you could set it just to be solid. But these, he found these actually, and he can tell you where he found these. But I, I have these. This is required in uh, Missouri report to have some kind of light on your life jacket. But these really do work really well. So, you see that? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the spotlight is also helpful, and there's a variety of spotlights, but at night you really can't see the day units because there's only a couple that are that I've seen on the river that actually have lights on them. So if you're trying to navigate the channel channel using the, the beacons or the markers, they do reflect at night. And so you can use your spotlight and scan the shoreline and you will pick them up. Take the clothes to them. So I would definitely have spotlight. Also, spotlight is helpful. Uh, when paddling at night, you can hear river features that you might want to know uh, where they are and what they are. So spotlight on, um, you know, a boil or some kind of a noisy wind dive will help you avoid that river, river hazard. This other useful gear, so a battle line, I like to have a battle line, or some kind of a roll on the boat. Boil blanket, I use those at least four times. Those are just little tiny emergency blankets, they're called, that you can stick it in your dry bag of dry clothes. And they actually will help keep you warm. Cell phone, which I would secure something because people have cell phones in the river. <laughs> Toilet paper. Keys, cash, throw over, they're, they're always nice to have too. For yourself, you can use them for something, or if you have, if your partner is in trouble, they're in the room. And there are, there's lots of information on, on you know, throwing ropes and other uh, and river hazards that are in other places. I'm not going to go into detail and all of you this, but, but there's lots of information out there for me to learn a little bit more about them. I always have a Bandana tied on my life jacket, which seems to help for a variety of things. And um, small car is helpful too if you're getting out of the river and going on the sandbar or if uh, a storm comes up and you put the tarp over your head and keep yourself even drier than you would with just your rain suit on. So I should mention too, just real quick. And, uh, if you're paddling in cool, cold weather, uh, I would certainly paddle a little more because, and think about what might happen to you don't have to deal with being cold in cold weather and hypothermic kind of incident. And this little slide is, is to illustrate um, if you have critter friends that you would like to take, make sure they have their life jacket on too. So when you're out there, there are other boats that you may see, the barges and power boats and jet skis. Oh my! <laughs> so this is a little slide on the barge. So the barges do have the right of way. They do use the channel as marked by the navigation aids primarily. They can take over a mile to stop. They have blind spots. The pilots may not see you. And they do use radar to navigate. And you don't show up on the radar, but if you have the reflective tape on your life jacket or on your boat, or both, apparently they will see you. So that is a good tip, Steve. <laughs> you wouldn't think that it'd be hard to hear, but they are. We've had barges come up pretty close and really not, you know, weren't paying attention and realized that they were right you know, close by, so just be aware, it doesn't hurt to look behind you once in a while, make sure that nothing's there. Big deal about the barges is they can create extreme turbulence, which can last a while. So if you're going to deal with the turbulence, then uh, it's a good idea to figure out a place to go when the barges are approaching. And I would make a plan and and um, execute that plan as soon as you know the barges are coming because we want to stay far away from the barge. 
One idea is that pain kind of would die. So just be head here, in here. Another idea is that if there's a boat ramp close by, just get the boat totally out of the water. Or if you're close to the end, or you can put it to hang out. So this is a helpful thing, and I do check this um, frequently if I'm having on the river. Where are the parties? So this is a Facebook page by Missouri River Navigation US Army Corps of Engineers group page. And on this page, it has and it's updated daily, at least during the barge season. It has the names, the barges that are on the river, their river mile, where they are at that point when this data is collected. If they're running up river or down river, uh, where, they're, where, where they're going, what their destination is. And if they're pushing a load or if they're empty. And so you can um, pretty much predict, if you think about it, what barges might be at the river mile where you are, where you're planning to pass that day. And so you can be aware of that and either avoid that day or just realize that they're out there and keep an eye out. The sand bridges, which are not as big a deal, but you do have to pay attention to where the little tubs are going. They're carrying the sand from the bridge to the shore or also on that chart. So it will tell you where the uh, capital sand is around the city. And, and uh, so you can predict they usually start at six o'clock in the morning and finish at six o'clock at night. Although I think sometimes they'll go from dawn to dusk. They don't run on Sundays. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so then we have power boats. So most of the time, they're very courteous, and this is not an issue. Of and they don't. Uh, the waves that they throw up are not as significant as the barges, and you can deal with those waves pretty easily just by turning your boat perpendicular or actually I prefer a little bit angled to the way this rolls in. And then it dissipates, it's gone. It's not like the barges that carry on for 20 minutes or a mile behind that turbulent space or uh and some people in a stable boat for experienced paddlers uh, do have the barge waves that now I don't do that. <laughs> so uh, the boat, the power boats, uh, you know, if you're using boat ramps, there can be at certain times of the day congestion. So you just have to keep an eye out. The power boats are not, are not a significant um, thing. Just to make sure, make sure they do see you, though. Sometimes you wonder because it looks like they're heading straight for you and then they'll be there. So I do like to keep, be aware. That they're out there, and that I tend to go closer to the bank if the power boat's coming. It's not like we're there and near the bank. There's also jet skis um, occasionally, and they will come. I've seen them come in groups, large groups of jet skis. I think there's a regular club that does it on a regular basis, certain sections of the river. I've seen groups hmm. um, of the same people in various spots. And they don't really pose a threat as long as they see you, which I'm sure that most of the time they do. The waves that they throw up are really nothing. So, so those are the boats you might see on the river, in addition to the paddlers. So then the river itself does have instructions. There are dives which are visible during the low water and submerged during high water. And paddling uh, when the river is high is, is not a good idea for, especially for a first or a novice paddler on the river. There are uh, significant changes when the river is high. There's floating debris and that too is affected by the stage. 
Um, there's not a lot of floating debris normally, but if the water has risen and the water then starts dropping, there will be debris as it clears, uh, as river level lowers and changes. So um, I did a river level chart coming back in. So there's also sand, which most of the time you can see because it, they'll be sticking out, and they tend to be uh, not in the middle, although occasionally there are, but they'll, they tend to be uh, toward the shoreline. They can also be below the water and helping when the water's fine. And then the channel markers themselves, the nuns and the cans, if um, they do tend to uh, drift around occasionally, especially if there's been a change in the water levels. The water rises. Sometimes you can't see them, but they'll be there, and then all of a sudden they will jump out, and then they'll go back down, and then they'll jump, and then they'll flop back and forth. Certain so river, river uh, levels, the cancer or nuns may be uh, a significant force that you would have to be aware of or need to be aware of. You can usually see the boils and the water features around these so that uh, you might pay attention and not go near that area and just watch. And a lot of times a nun or a camel will show them. Yeah. But again, these are not huge threats. Um, so don't let this intimidate anyone. River levels are um, a bit um, our goods and cattle uh, and it goes on the next slide are you know, the river is lower. When the river is high, the family condition can be treacherous because you cannot see what's underneath the water. You may wind up on a river obstruction that um, all of a sudden that you aren't aware of. And so it can be a little more treacherous paddling in, in uh, high uh, river levels. Also, the boils, which carries here, is uh, they are more significant. If the water is high. And the boils are um, usually not a threat, they're kind of fun to paddle through, but if the river is high, they get pretty dramatic. And sometimes they'll twist your boat so you see the kind of through those. So what's a boil? Then? So a boil, it carries here, and if I get this incorrect <laughs> pop up, it's a uh, the feature that creates the boil is a sand dune. Yes, and it's live at the, the bottom of the river, and, and she has this great talk on the YouTube uh, channel of the Missouri River Relief uh, <clears throat> website, which talks about the river of sand. It explains that, but the boils are the sand dunes underneath the, you know, underneath you, and the bottom of the river, the sandy bottom of the river, mimics the, the deserts, like the winds, create the same kind of sand dunes that the river water creates. And that's what the boils are. And so you're kind of going up. And sometimes you can feel that actually <laughs> when you go through these boils over the sand dunes that close. Yeah, it's firmly like it's coming off the dunes and they're moving. Yeah. And they're also acting. You need a lot of oil <laughs> to find those oils. <laughs> so I also use this uh, National Weather Service Advanced Hydraulic Prediction to um, tell me what the river level is going to be before I go paddle the river. If you want to have the river where the, when there's lots of sandbars, and this is at Jefferson City, because that's closest to where I live, that's the river gauge, then uh, you would look for something around four or five feet. The wind backs are showing, the current is slower, there's a lot of sandbars. This would be a nice time to go have the river for the first time when the water is low. At about 12 feet in the Jeff City gauge, um, the big sandbars are still showing, and the docks are mostly showing, but the current is picked up now. So you, if you're interested in speed, you can go a little faster at 12 feet. And I, this is a good, actually, reporting level, about 12 feet. 
It gets lower than that, but the inverters get a little slower, but 11, 12 feet is good, good current speed, in my opinion. If it gets up to around 18 feet, then there's no sandbars, and the obstructions are submerged, even though flood stays at 23 feet, action stays up to 20 feet. 18 feet is getting beyond what I like to do with on the river. The boils are significant. Um, current stacks, the obstructions are submerged. You need to get off of the river. You know, there's not much bank, and it's more like having the tree lines. So this is just in general what I like to have. Fours, 11, 12, 13, 18 is too much. So if you have a look at this, and this is available. I think this river uh, sources are is being developed right now. So right here, to um, there's a link to this the page you built. The page that you're working. So before long, there'll be lots of information on the website too. But there's a lot of it. There's already one. <laughs> that would be a place to look. Another thing that is the river has is the mud. So uh, it can be slick and it can be deep. So just be aware that if you're being out uh, even on a boat ramp or on a sandbar, it might actually be a mud bar. So just be aware that you might lose your shoes if you're wearing flip flops or something like that. <laughs> it's all <okay. laughs> Okay, so this could be a big deal, the weather. Um, so the weather may change rapidly on the river. And it can be difficult to get off. So I would look if you have a dramatic change in temperature. It may indicate that there's going to be a changing weather. See here. The wind changes, the wind speed and wind direction. They also indicate change in weather. And sometimes, you know, these it looks like the, the weather report is said, and you know, there's not much in the area, but sometimes things blow up quickly. And on the river, they do blow up quickly. So the dark cloud could be another indicator that you know you need to pick a spot to get off and just wait to see what happens. Certainly fog, you don't want to have one the fog because you really can't see where you're going and others cannot see you. So uh, I'm sure everyone who's paddled the river has had an experience with the weather. One, and I did many, one of the more dramatic ones, but uh, I was with two uh, other paddlers. I was in a car and they were in the game. And we were behind, the we were close to the casino in Boonville. And the storm just popped up out of nowhere and the winds got really fierce. The chop in the river was significant and it was pouring down rain. So we decided that we were going to abandon our plan. It's always good to have a plan B and see if we could get into the casino and call when the gentleman slides. So that's what we did. So we got out of the river, pulled the the <laughs> canoe of the kayak up and it's got this large fence all around it. So we were walking around the fence. The guard came out and asked us what we were doing. And we told him. And so he opened the gate and let us bring the kayak and the canoe in, sit down the parking lot. We were so wet. He let us come into the casino and sit in the lobby and wait until one of the wives came and got us in the band <laughs> Kansas was playing. <laughs> Did you feel like dust in the wind or what? <laughs> so anyway, it, it's, it's good to pay attention to the weather and the weather signs. The fog too can be really disorienting. Um, Pounding in the fog, you may think you're headed down river downstream, but you can get twisted around pretty easily and you wouldn't think this would happen, but I've been in the river when I shouldn't have and I've gone past Cooper's about two or three times before I figured out that it was not a place to be. So 
I don't know why they get that you can get disoriented in the fog and have a stream. So so I was recommending you don't have the fog. So this is just a little shot on uh, managing your bubble wire. And we've already, already talked about some of these. The boat ramps, um, some of the boat ramps, I would think about, um, well, there's some boat ramps that are harder to manage than others. They have their own special little puzzles on each little ramp. And um, I just, uh, back, Two slides back, uh, Hunter and I actually turned over at Jim City because the, at that river level, the wind guide was way out and we didn't correctly come into that boat ramp. And that 22 foot boat, uh, once we hit the little comma, water on the side of the ramp, the current puts that boat around pretty quickly and we reacted to suddenly the jump. So, it's good. Um, not all boat ramps are hard to get in and out of, but some need special consideration. So, I have a suggestion on another the upcoming slide about learning about boat ramps and having an increase some things before you try to and, uh, negotiate some of these ramps. Some of them aren't bad at all. Catfish Cadiz is an easy one to get into, Hartsburg is an easy one to get into. So, so uh, these other things are just about controlling your boat and when conditions and chop. I think the main message here is um, to be comfortable with your boat on paddling a creek um, a bunch before you try paddling on the river because the current is the wind and other things we might do with is a is uh, a little more. So make sure you control your boat. That's really the main message here. So just keep diving. Um, understand the risk of the river, understand the potential for changing conditions, check the forecast and river level before you go out, mm. have appropriate gear for the, gear, the conditions, a little more things in cold weather. Let someone know your itinerary. I, mean, I think it's, a, it's an important one. So someone knows you're out there and knows when you safety be bad. Um, Practicing self rescue is a good idea. There's uh, lots of information on that. So you practice throwing yourself out of the boat, and this would be like off the lake. Um, Some places it's easy to, so you have to deal with the kind of current and see if you can get it back in the boat or what it feels like to just fall out of the boat. And I think one of the most important things really is to paddle with someone. So you have someone that you're paddling with. and. Uh, especially for the first few times on the river before you feel comfortable enough to paddle by yourself. So this is a whole boat of people <laughs> <laughs> that we can paddle with. So once um, you know, you've got the safety things, you can now start, and you have your boat, you can start planning a trip. This shot is uh, across from Catfish Cave, the, little, the boat ramps on the edge here, the Catfish Cave ramp, which we now have access to, which is a great ramp in my opinion. And right across from Catfish Cave is this great sandbar called Airplane Island. So when you think about your trip, think about how much time you have. So you'll have to consider a shuttle if you have a vehicle at one end where you could put in and a vehicle at another end where you took out, or if you have someone driving you off and picking you up, you may have a shuttle um, is probably necessary on the Missouri until you feel comfortable enough to have upstream, which is also doable, especially in the cold water, but it's a whole different deal. So shuttle times to be considered as well as you know the time it takes to load the boat, unload the boat, pack the boat with your gear. Actually, if you have time on the water, then you take it out, take the gear out, load the boat. So it's all part of the time included in your trip. Sometimes people don't think about that. They think, oh, I'll just go have the river for a little bit. But Knowing the whole picture might be helpful if you're on a time schedule. So, have a plan B in case something happens. You know, what am I going to do if I get in trouble? And then, 
I would keep, you know, the paddle trips short until you're comfortable on the river. So here's how are you going to exit the river? You might think about that. The Missouri Department of Conservation has big boat ramps. Uh, if you want to use boat ramps, which are directly on the river, some of them are uh, easy to, to find, others are a long twisted two lane gravel roads. But there is a lot of information on these uh, boat ramps from the Department of Conservation and uh, where they are and how to find them, how to get there. Sometimes you might uh, consider the security in some of these areas. Some of these boat ramps are pretty remote, so you might think about that or ask other paddlers their opinions on some of these boat ramps, but for the most part. There's um, also a paddler's bank access at Eagle Bluffs, which is close by in the Columbia area, which is, uh, there's no power boats or a ramp or anything. It's a brick ramp, which I have a picture of here so. There's also other rivers. If you don't want to put in directly on the Missouri, there's boat ramps on the Lodine River, the Monroe River, the Osage River. There, a lot of those boat ramps is where you can actually access the river. But my favorite is the access on the creeks. It gives you a chance to uh, paddle a little bit, and get yourself warmed up on the creek, and then you can go on the river from the creek. And the, this is a shot from uh, Providence Landing, Croce Creek, as we were getting ready to do our routine paddle and turn upstream to Lupus and then come back, which requires no shovel. That's the advantage of the upstream of that. So uh, there's Perchy Creek, Montauk Creek, and Rochefort. It's a little hard to uh, find, but that's not a bad place to put in. And then Cedar Creek, which at Capitol View is right off of 63 in Columbia City. It's been signed for Capitol View. There's a great pile of rock. Can you, can you repeat that? There's a great big pile of rock where? At the Rochefort. Uh, oh, the Rochefort ramp. Monotaw Creek. The Monotaw Creek ramp. Yeah. Great big pile of rock. And yeah. is it put, was it put there by somebody? It was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the city is making improvements. Do we, do we know why that's there? Uh, the ramp separated uh, was put drop off. So they're trying to fix it. It, it was basically put there to keep the motor going from like losing a motor or an actual couple of add ons. Oh, so in Well, that would be possible. So that's good to know. So we should wait yeah. before we go there. So verify. <laughs> since I don't mind, I'll just repeat what Drew just said, but. Um, he was just saying that part of the ramp separated, and so it would be dangerous for anyone with a motor boat trying to back a boat down in there. And I imagine that partially because the river is so low, but yeah. they put the rock there basically just to stop people until they get a chance to fix that ramp. Um, and I know Melanie just the other day was able to get a boat in by pulling it around it, but it wasn't ideal. <laughs> a canoe, not a, not a motor boat. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for anything, yeah, information that needs to be updated. Yeah, I mean, it's always, you know, good to know that like the ramps are always changing and yeah. sometimes the river comes up and then it drops eight feet and everything's covered in mud. And, you know, you asked your buddy if everything was cool and two days ago it was great, <laughs> you know, but. Never know. Yeah. I've, I've had occasion to uh, take a driftwood and put it on the double low ramp at uh, Roachport, so you have a big raft to get it down through the water to the creek. It's yeah. Everything's So, this is an actual river raft that is at Eagle Bluffs and it's designated as, where's my, as a, uh, 
access bar, kayaks, canoes, paddle boards, non-motorized boats. And so this is accessible. You might, you know, watch your footing, but they can do that. And that's uh, actually a good spot to put in, I think, person. So uh, on the sharp trip ideas, we could use this. So uh, one idea, and this is about a five mile trip for a person who's not paddled the river or has a little experience on the river, would be put in at Catfish Cadiz, which is river mile 180, and paddle to Eagle Bluffs, which is river mile 175, 25. That would be about a five mile paddle. And both of these spots are easily accessed by vehicles. And some of the sites you might see are Airplane Island, the sandbar, which is across from Catfish Caves. You see the hills of Lucas, which were very pretty. We see California Island, which is another big sandbar. So that would be a nice paddle to experience the river for the first time. Another sharp paddle would be from Eagle Bluffs, which is one mile, which is River Mile 175, to Virgin Creek, which is River Mile 170. And that would be about a six and a half mile trip. And I estimated the hours of paddle time, but you know, it's that's <laughs> depending on how aggressive you are, or if you just want to float, look at things, or the current is really slow. So that's just the edge, really. But it does give you five miles on the river and then 1.3 miles on Fraser Creek to the Providence Landing Boat Ramp, which, uh, for the most part, it's uh, maintained. <laughs> Where do you get this information? That's a really good question. So, um, the Department of uh, Missouri Department of Conservation has these are that is a conservation boat ramp data. Also, the river ramp is maintained as well as catfish caves by the Department of Conservation, and we can Google that and find those. I actually had a book that we used uh, for a while that had all the boat ramps in it. But do you is there more specific information on? We don't know. Yeah, I yes. can Probably give you. Is. Like what one option as well, there's a website called I don't remember the exact website, but it's um Missouri River Water Trail. And that was put together by the Department of Natural Resources. Um it's not necessarily totally up to date, but as far as a website resource, it's probably the best resource to find all the different access points on the Missouri River. Um, so that's a Missouri River Water Trail. Um, Could you call them and they will tell you anything that's new? I mean, it, good luck with that. Okay. Yeah, there's probably nobody that you would call directly that actually knows what they're talking about. That would be my guess. <laughs> you might put links to some of this at the end of once we put this on. The yeah, yeah. This. This presentation will end up being an archive presentation on the Big Muddy Speakers series website, and we'll try to collect as many helpful links as we have, you know, can. We're working on those kinds of links for the Missouri River Relief website, but it's going to, it's a process. And honestly, I don't think there's any really good resources for this information. Um, there's a lot of resources that are hard to find. Um, and some of them are really good, but um, they're hard to find. Yeah. I, I'd like to add to that list. Sure. The things that you were Back saying here. about shovels, I I like to do that. I was going to, okay, thank okay, you. Are you ready to go? No, I'm glad you said that. I We tried to do that one time. Ago. <laughs> How would that work, Dave? Well, well there's a lot from... From um, well, Hartsburg down to say the Cave, every about every fifteen miles on the uh, the uh, uh, river river left, there is uh, uh, well, there's a ramp, and it's usually accessible easily or with a little effort. 
from the uh, the uh, Katy Trail. And so what I like to do is drop my boat at a ramp, go down the street and drop my uh, my vehicle, and then bicycle up to my boat, lock up my boat, my bicycle, or if I'm using a canoe, put the bicycle in the canoe and paddle back down. The shuttle, I get a workout both ways. I've heard of more body workouts, and I don't have to rely on anybody else for shuttle. Yeah, and I think that's a great idea. And, and, we, had, and we actually, I actually had tried it. Um, we had an unfortunate experience because we didn't, I assume that you secure your canoe or body with some kind of lock or something. Yeah, because we did not, and um, the canoe was stolen from me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the first degree. Yeah. So, but that is a great idea. And I have tried it, and that's, I like that idea. Well, I want to throw one more out, which is. Yeah. For Boone County people, the absolute easiest you could possibly do, and that's between Catfish Katie's and Cooper's Landing. Now that Catfish Katie's is open to the public, um, it's directly accessible by the Katie Trail. Right. Cooper's Landing, totally accessible by the Katie Trail, you know, and man, hopefully in the next few years, we'll get, we'll get some amenities down there for locking bikes and I mean, I'm going to write a grant for a kayak locker, and we're going to have some, you know, something for people that don't even have their own boats. Maybe. You know, yep. we'll see. Wouldn't what, that be cool? What a wonderful idea. Yeah. And, and once you get through, wouldn't you get enough strength? Uh, uh, you know, I, I put it at uh, Terry Gong down the, uh, the rip rack at, uh, yeah. at, at uh, Eagle Bluff. I'm paddling upstream as far as I, I could go and then come back down, up and down. There's a right. shuttle right across the movements to a concert and then paddle back home. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 I've done that too. And I, and I hope that people do try to paddle upstream. It has its own, you know, little deal. But yeah, uh, I think you have to have some great way to go. And that was our regular panel thing for years. Go upstream. And Carrie yeah, has a question. Oh, I'm just going to say the paddle paddle that Steve mentioned in the Catfish Cave to Coopers. I did that three weeks ago with about eight people. It's super easy and fun. Yeah, good. Well, thank you for suggesting that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's really great. Yeah. Anything else on that before just a couple of more trips that are possible? But they don't involve the bicycle, but uh, they certainly could because uh, you know the Katy Trail is right there, so it'll be a great thing to do. This was Camp Beach um, in 2019 when it was flooded. There's a bunch of pictures behind it. But another, since we can't really get on the Montauk Creek yet, but we will soon, uh, we would start there and then go all the way down to Camp Beach Cadiz, which is about a six and a half mile trip. And then you can see the pictographs if you can find them on the laptop books. And I'll try to help you find those in the next slide. And you can go under the I-70 bridge, which is probably not recommended right now because we don't know when they're going to be complete with that construction on the I-70 bridge. So we might wait a while on this one for the bed to open up. But Catfish Caves, the Perky Creek still do a little. And Perky Creek, uh, that, uh, Providence Landing is right on the trail also. So you could actually, you know, if you want to paddle the creek or paddle down, and then another way you can do uh, a bike to the Providence Landing also. So a lot of the trail follows the river, so it's in a lot of places. So that's a great idea. Okay. Cooper's Landing has beer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. I've got one about uh, art spread from just sitting from Cooper's to art spread. Uh, when I come in at night, I can sign in on the teenage uh, cruising the ramp for a location and then emerge out of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right, so there, now that we've seen, and I think you're safe, I think we're both, a couple of ideas, more than one idea for getting out of the river and managing your shuttle and your time and whatnot. Now we're ready to do your boys of discovery. 
And this is really the best part. And this is why I still love having the Missouri River. And I've been uh, questioned at times of why do I have that dirty river that looks like chocolate? You know? <laughs> and it, so this is why. <laughs> This is actually, in my opinion, for a long time, was my wilderness experience because often out there, you know, there's nothing. There's no people. There's lots of wildlife. It's serene, and there aren't those magic moments. So there's all kinds of plants and sounds and different landscapes and reminders of the river's fascinating history. And this is one. So these are the Montauk Bluffs that I mentioned just a minute ago on one of the trips. These are near, these are in between Montauk Creek and Nassau Bridge at about, oh, a river mile, 185-ish, 186-ish. Can't really see them in this slide, and they are kind of hard to see on the river unless from the river unless you know right where they are. But this, this is what they look like. This is a pictograph from in, indigenous peoples of long ago. And then there's another one that's still present. So these are kind of fun to see. And these are, there's a there's signage about this on the Katie Trail. It explains a little more about what we saw and where they came from, at least their uh, hypotheses about them. But I believe there's a spring, is that right? Underneath these. Yeah. Down. I, just out of that picture there. Yes, yeah, just right. So it, it, here. it looks like a waterfall coming yeah. under the Katy Trail from the river. And it's actually just a few miles downstream of the I-70 bridge. Oh, so I'm on the wrong side. Yeah. So it's downstream from the I-70 bridge. Yep. So it's about river mile. Yeah, something like that. I had that on my notes and I want to see that. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's good to have a fact check. That's great. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Okay, so here's uh, another interesting uh, part of history that, um, you know, it's what happens on the river long ago when there were what engaged lady in the country mm -hmm. all the steamboats. And I think there's a YouTube on the uh, Missouri River Relief uh, series, Big Money series website that uh, was given not too long ago about the disasters, the shipwreck disasters. It's pretty interesting. So you might Google that or, or look at that for um, see what disasters are going to blow Missouri River to make it better. To get a little more information on that. But I just took a little snip of that map, which is um, at the Historical Society, um, this map that was uh, created in 1897 by a gentleman, a river captain named Chippendale, Orange Captain, and looked at the steamboat racks from, you know, where we live from Boonville on a Jeff City, and it's quite a few. Some of the river bins are named after the steamboats that went down in that area, like there's Diana Bend. And there's flower again, those are both steamboats that were actually in that area. It's kind of cool to know. And just recently, and Carrie probably provided me the slide, there's another possible steamship wreck, steamboat wreck uh, near down uh, from Boonville. So they're exploring this. This appeared on a, on a sonar when they were. Uh, looking at um, the uh, telescopes. So that's been in the news just recently, but so there's always those, those, those kinds of things to think about on the river. It's kind of cool to think about the steamboats that were there and the, the native or the indigenous peoples that were there. And also, there's remnants of um, the wooden wing dots that they had poured into their original place on the river. Sacred statue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this, yeah, I think Steve Schnorr has a um, 
explore the big money or this uh, on or something about the big money series. Your talk about this, they even talk about this, it's on the website. Yeah. Um, no, your big money, no, you're maybe. Not. Do you have another story or a different story? Anyway, there's a lot of there's stories. Lot of story. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they're, yeah. Um, I personally, I think at this point, the more outlandish, the better. So <laughs> that, it's the first like stolen airplane story that I've heard. So that, I like that one. Yeah. What's, what's your story? I mean, it was just, my, I think the one, you know, the one I've heard the most is, uh, a, that it was like a guy who was drunk and he usually lands on the island. And this time he kind of crashed and broke his landing gear and escaped like through what is now Tadpole Island or something, you know? I've heard other stuff. And I've, I've actually heard of people not related to the name of the island who've crashed airplanes on that island after. <laughs> um, even just like two years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. They like kind of dipped down and hit their propeller in the sand and then they had to like go get a replacement repeller. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, there was another story and it was like New Year's Eve or something. And I think it was Claysville Island and Carl Zeb Carl Edward had a couple friends and they landed on Claysville Island. They like cooked some s'mores and took off. But in the meantime, there was like this, like all alert bulletin. And it was like in the 10 o'clock news that this plane had crashed on the Missouri River and like everyone was going to find him but by the time they got there like they were gone and then the story i heard was that they um that you know like they found out it was carl edward and they were just kind of like oh so like no, that story just died you know like there was no end to it well, I think Um, 
and listen to some of these warblers in things along the river, south of the river, are cool too. So we have the rivers, and we have the uh, birds in the air, and we have the fishes in the river, which are these are some of the, the selection of the sea scene, and fishes of the rolling prairie. Some of these are pretty rare, and uh, it's not likely to see some of these, but. Uh, it's likely that you want to be. So our first, uh, the first time Ken and I did the observe uh, before we are team name was Carp Targets. <laughs> we were targeted quite frequently by the car. <laughs> Which um, my coach just let them walk and then they're big age to threat, move them out of their paddle. I know there's other ways of getting them off you and out of the boat, but we had a shot of car. <laughs> and this is a lovely display of the car by Sherry Elliott, which is, they made a really beautiful art display. <laughs> More so than in the river. <laughs> so they could be out of the river along. There's also, in addition to the fishes and the birds, uh, you know, a variety of amphibians, the frogs, and you can certainly hear this in springtime and summertime. And sometimes we kind of along the shoreline going out straight and see a variety of frogs that just kind of pop. Into the water as we, you know, stir them up with our paddle strokes. They're, they're out there. Like an vertebrae, just, just a, an abundance of a variety of wildlife in the Surrey River. So it's, it's nice to think about and appreciate those things when you're out there. So, in addition to the, the critters that you might encounter, which also include river otter, beaver, deer, just all kinds of things. Um, it's kind of fun to know a little bit about the hydraulics. And this is the only slide I have on this that is here back here. Um, this shot, this slide illustrates um, the channel and the speed of the river in this shot and how the channel as it follows the outside river bend is where the fastest water is. Slope water would be on the inside, it would be in where the wind dikes are pushing out and channeling the water across into the outside of the river. It's just a cool way of presenting how the current is managed and where the fast is flowing. The same thing more about it? No. <laughs> So there's the hydraulics, you know, there's the boils, the river speed, but all the different things you can learn about the water. And then there's the natural beauty of the river, which can be spectacular. You can see things from the river that you can't see in the other way. There's a bluffs in the fields and the hills and the sandbars and the seasonal changes. It's pretty fabulous. Um, there's also, you know, I did not go out on the river to sit, but this is from uh, Perchy Creek, which had no ice flow on it. So I just paddled down, and you could hear the ice crackle. You could see how the ice is formed on the top, and then on the bottom, there's this huge conglomerate of like an iceberg thing underneath the little top part that's exhibited. That's um, just a Seasonal change. And so the river, this is not too long ago. This is a little uh, actually. It's the dog being Joe. So when the river's <laughs> up or when the river is not manageable, or when the actually when the river is high, it's actually pretty fun to have a creeks. This is Cedar Creek. Um, so you can get up and to the creeks. A lot farther when the river weather when the river level is high. And so it's kind of fun if you can't get on the river just to explore the creeks. But when it's really high, put it from the road. <laughs> and 
And then there's the magic of the landscape. So I think this, you know, we've all had our magical moments if you've been out there in some form and seen the changes in the line and the sparkling diamonds on the water, the cloud formation, the sunrise, the sunset, and the stars, the meteor showers. I uh, can't remember one time have an upstream river in the morning to the kayaks around and just floated down if we watch this spectacular meteor shower overhead. There's those kinds of magical moments that are out there that uh, look forward to this one to heaven. You can also hear, you might hear the eagles calling, the heron sparking, the snow bees honking overhead, the cottonwoods with spring, which is always fun when we're in one, and the owls and the coyotes. And you might find driftwood, arrowheads, fossils, and even a message in a bottle. <laughs> so, just did some, um, that's why I'm at the Missouri River. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank all the staff of Missouri River Relief for their dedication to Missouri River in so many different ways with so many amazing programs. And, and thank you all for coming and thank you for listening to my presentation. information that I don't know. <laughs> Great questions. Um, I just have a couple of comments. Um, as a motor voter, yes. as well as a paddler, um, I was, uh, yeah, I was voting, motor voting on the river this past Saturday. And um, yeah, I was cruising upstream, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty experienced, but um, I did not see a paddler coming towards me downstream. So I'm, I'm navigating upstream. They were in the channel. It was a solo kayaker. Um, they were in a white epic kayak. Um, I did not see them until one of my passengers actually pointed them out. Um, so, yeah, I think as far as visibility, just being a safety point, you know, yes. having in groups is yeah. a great idea. This is in the daylight, you know, this is not even at night. But just like, you know, if you're in a group, that's great. You're more visible when you're together. Uh, if you're wearing bright colors, you're visible, that's good. Um, I think if you have a motorboat approaching you as a paddler, it's a really good idea to have like, a white flashing light, you know, just like bikers or bicyclists have, you know, when they're on the roads. Um, even in the daylight, I think the light would be kind of a visible feature when there's a, a, a motorboat approaching you and then yeah. they don't see you. So, yeah, yeah. No, I thank you for that comment. I do uh, always worry about am I going to see? And yeah. I'm going to see having trouble to get out of the channel as much as possible and get to the shore. Mm -hmm. them. I assume the motorboats are not going to be close to the shore, but the but, but visibility is critical. And so a spotlight or colors or groups is a great suggestion. Or even you mentioned the um, reflective tape on your paddles. And I have noticed like when you're paddling yes. constantly, like you have a double bladed paddle, if you have a reflection on those paddles too, those are really visible to motorboats as well. So um, these are all great things to think of, not just at night, you know, yes, yeah. you should have your headlamp and your light navigation lights, but um, having these extra visible features, even in the daylight, is important for safety. Um, and just my second point, um, you had sort of like the river levels and different things that you checked before going on the river. Like as a, a paddler myself, one of the biggest things I check is the wind. Yes. So if the wind is like over 15 miles per hour, I'm not that interested in paddling. <laughs> I would agree with that. And, you know, unless it's like in your favor, then you know it's going to be an push a tailwind. Right, right. But um, yeah, usually, you know, if that wind is really high, that's a, just a telltale sign for me. 
that I'm like, oh, if it's a number 15, maybe I'm gonna put this one out or go yes. to somewhere that's more protected than the Missouri River. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot to mention a lot about the wind. I think for just on a normal day, the wind speed will pick up no matter what it's around 10 o'clock. And then the middle of the day when the sun is up, the wind is more than it is in the early morning and late afternoon or early evening. So from 10 to 4, if there's any wind at all, we'll be out there. And it is a pain to paddle into a strong headwind. Often, um, if there's a, a wind, uh, which is, I just, you know, six miles an hour, that's real pretty good. Um, if you go and, you know, around the river bend, sometimes the wind direction changes. So, so for a paddler, keeping, if, it, if you have a strong headwind, you know, keeping the boat pointed into the wind so it doesn't hit you from the side. Yeah, thank you. I've got one other tip too about um, making yourself visible to the motorboats that are approaching. Like, this does not always work. You have to be situationally aware, but turning your boat actually to the side makes like a bigger display. You know, if you're pointed, especially if you have a really low profile boat, like an epic kayak, like we were talking about, or soup ski. You know, that pretty much disappears, you know, but even just turning that thing to the side, you have to, again, be situationally aware that um, if they're coming straight at you, you certainly may not want to do that, but um, that that can like show up, you can wave your paddle, you know, those are all things I've done before, and, and also you see like they all just see now, and they turn, you know. Um, <laughs> right? Well, I'm pretty loud anyway, but um, so so a lot of these lights and a lot of these um, really nifty tools. I really like that waterproof light for uh, like that's perfect. <laughs> How are they available at most kind of good sporting goods, big box kind of store? You don't have to be any like specific, but are they relatively easy to find? So um, on the River Miles side, these are. Uh, there's a link to where to find these. They are not, unfortunately, like at Alpine Shoppers, are the big box stores that you would think. Yeah, go ahead. Alpine Shop yeah. does have them. They do have them now. Oh, good. Okay. okay. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. But this one, this one is a special one. See, can you tell them when I'm just here? I got that through the contact with the GF and 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 the GF but yeah, it's great. It's better. Why are those kind of other scenes? There's a couple different places to make them that I found. Okay. Well, maybe we could put a link to that and we supply that information. Because I think a lot of people would be interested in that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to put it in your mind. You know, I'm going to put it in your mind. Oh, yeah. Even if you have them, sorry for not being pretty large. Yeah. And this is required here for the Missouri River to report some kind of a line on your life jacket for the PMT. So, this is the best one I've ever seen. The other vegetables might use like um, the chemical lights, right? Right, right. Okay, anything else? No, all right, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for put so much thought into, into this. It's beautiful. And like, I think this should be a book. So, I think it should start a movie. Like, there's a beautiful book in there of really useful information. Or we could just host it on our website. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, I also want to give a shout out to David Owens, who's been running the sound tonight. So, that's the film.
We've been that for free for many, many years. So thank you so much, David. And um, just a reminder that this weekend is the Road to Port Wine Stroll from four to eight, 25 bucks. Get your tickets, support Road to Port Merchants and see all the cool stuff that's going on. It's always kind of changing and evolving. So um, it could be a good weekend. But that's really cool. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight and sharing like your river knowledge too. Um, so we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.